Hello, I'm Zach Cesaro, and I'd like to welcome you to my talk on green ammonia. In the next 24 hours, humans will extract almost 100 million barrels of oil from the earth. It's hard to visualize that amount of black sludge being extracted. What does 100 million barrels a day look like? Well, if we were able to combine all of the oil wells from around the world, it would form a tremendous river of oil, a vital vein of energy feeding our society. And this river would be about three times the River Thames, which runs through London. And that's just oil. If we were to add natural gas and coal, this non-stop river of fossil fuels would be about seven Thames rivers. Seven Thames rivers of fossil fuels pouring out of the earth every second of every day. And these carbon atoms ultimately end up as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It may sound like a dystopic vision, but this is the state of our energy systems today. And if this were an exam problem, we would have seven times river of fossil fuels and about 10 years to cut that in half, according to the latest UN report, and until 2050 to completely eliminate it. These fossil fuels are fueling everything from our airplanes to our container ships, from our cement kilns to the heat in our homes, from our building materials to the food we eat. The technology options we have to replace these rivers of fossil fuels are founded on the mighty wind turbine and solar panel, which we have been developing over the last few decades. And they're great, but they still contribute less than 5% to our global energy mix. And including hydro and nuclear power, we do not even have one Thames River equivalent of oil in renewable energy today. One crux of the problem is storing energy. Solar and wind energy will be pillars of our new energy systems, but the sun goes down every day and the wind comes and goes. We need to be able to store that energy. We also need to be able to transport that energy once we store it, to connect the places that have lots of wind and solar energy, like the deserts in Australia, to the places that need renewable energy, like the cities in Japan. When we think of energy storage, batteries jump to mind. And batteries are great for some applications like cell phones and our cars. But they are too heavy and space consuming for larger vehicles like ships that need to travel a long distance or for trading energy between regions like from Australia to Japan. Uh, you'd never fill up a battery in Australia and ship it to Japan. It wouldn't make any economic sense. For these applications, a liquid fuel similar to the carbon-based fossil fuels we use today would be the best option because liquid fuels can store so much energy in such a small space and mass. They are so densely packed with energy in those chemical bonds. And one of the most promising liquid fuels is called green ammonia. And this up and coming fuel, I believe, will play a central role in turning off the tap on fossil fuels. So green ammonia consists of the chemical formula NH3, which is one nitrogen atom and three hydrogen atoms to make up the molecule. Green ammonia is an energy dense chemical that is produced from three ingredients, air, water, including desalinated seawater, and renewable electricity, like wind and solar. That is it. Three ingredients, nitrogen from air, hydrogen from H2O or water, and renewable electricity to power the process and get a liquid energy dense fuel. And not only is green ammonia renewable to make and completely free from carbon, but the byproducts of turning green ammonia back into electricity are once again, air, water, and renewable electricity. It's a completely sustainable cycle and fundamentally carbon free. And this new fuel is gearing up to take on fossil fuels. And there are three sectors where it's leading the way. And at first they sound a bit behind the scenes, but each of them has such a large carbon impact that they're quite important. First is the fertilizer sector. Each year, the fertilizer sector uses almost 200 million tons of brown ammonia to put nitrogen back into the soil for the plants to grow our food. Most of the food you buy today in the grocery store required ammonia to grow. And this ammonia was produced from fossil fuels. But green ammonia will be relatively straightforward to switch for brown ammonia in this sector, and the impact will be huge. Global carbon dioxide emissions will be reduced by 2% in this one switch alone. The second sector looking at green ammonia is the shipping fuel sector. 
Today, products we order from overseas are shipped on big container ships. Those jeans, that cell phone, that refrigerator, all manufactured overseas and shipped using heavy fuel oil. And heavy fuel oil is one of the dirtiest fossil fuels imaginable. This is a huge sector accounting for almost 3% of global energy, and green ammonia is the leading candidate fuel as a drop-in fuel for these massive shipping engines. The leading ship engine manufacturer has announced that by 2024, they will have a green ammonia engine on the market. The third and final use for green ammonia is trading energy between regions, such as Australia to Japan, who are looking to trade the desert in Western Australia, which is rich in solar and wind resources, to the cities in Japan. Green ammonia might be used directly in power plants in places like Japan, or it might be used to carry hydrogen to these places for end uses like hydrogen fuel cell trains, trucks, and buses. One important attribute of ammonia is that it can be cracked open to release the hydrogen inside. Imagine ammonia is like a walnut, and hydrogen is the kernel inside. And with a nut cracking type of device, which we have today, we can move liquid ammonia around, which is cheap and easy, and crack it to get the valuable hydrogen where we need it. Hydrogen, on the other hand, that kernel, is particularly difficult to store and transport. It's the smallest molecule in the universe. This is an important feature of ammonia that we can move hydrogen around as ammonia and crack it where and when we need the hydrogen. In many ways, green ammonia is going to be a behind the scenes type of fuel, but it is essential for decarbonizing some important parts of our lives. The fertilizer, which is used to grow our food, the shipping fuel we use to move goods around the world, and trading between countries so that we can get energy and hydrogen into our cities at the times and places we need it. But green ammonia is a new field and it's very active and, and we're even researching running airplanes on green ammonia. Now, one common question I get is, will I be running my car on green ammonia? And my answer is probably not. Green ammonia is a regulated chemical with a terrible smell and risks to humans if not properly handled. While ammonia is less explosive than fossil fuels or hydrogen, it's more of a health hazard when inhaled. Therefore, green ammonia is mostly being considered in applications where trained operators can safely use the chemical. Another common question I get is, why isn't this happening yet? And the short answer is cost. Green ammonia is about 1.5 times the cost of where it needs to be to compete. The good thing is that this is fundamentally linked to two factors. First, the price of wind and solar electricity, which have been coming down. And second, the price of electrolyzers, which are the clever device that splits water into hydrogen and oxygen. As part of COVID stimulus packages, Many projects involving electrolyzers have been announced, and this deployment will drive the cost further down quicker. Finally, policy is crucial. Mechanisms like carbon pricing are needed to accelerate the deployment and make fossil fuels less attractive in comparison. International cooperation and regulation is needed to decarbonize sectors like the fertilizer sector and the shipping sector, which are inherently global sectors. There is one last attribute of green ammonia that's important to talk about. Making new energy systems at global scale takes time, decades, and in this case, we don't even have a decade. This is actually the most important part of the green ammonia story. It's phenomenally scalable quickly. Ammonia plants already exist today in more than 64 countries, and we ship ammonia around millions of tons per year between countries and have thousands of kilometers of ammonia pipeline in the ground. While the green production process is slightly different than the fossil fuel based process, the relevant technologies and infrastructure are already there. My colleagues and I work at the world's first round trip green ammonia plant, going from power to ammonia back to power. We take renewable electricity, in our case wind, air and water, make a liquid ammonia fuel and then combust it again to make air, water and renewable electricity. The plant was built in 2018 by Siemens, the UK SDFC, Cardiff University, and the University of Oxford, near Oxford in the UK. The next plants, already at industrial scales, are being built today. And there are announced projects in Saudi Arabia, Australia, New Zealand, Spain, Norway, Morocco, the Netherlands, Chile, the US, all over the place. Because the gears of scale, finance, technology, policy, are beginning to turn for green ammonia. Billions of dollars of investment 
were announced in green ammonia projects in 2020, and we seem poised for a very rapid scale up of this technology. But there are many remaining questions and considerations about green ammonia as a fuel of the future. Will the oil and gas majors become ammonia companies? Will ammonia follow in the geopolitical footsteps of oil with power concentrated in the hands of a few countries and companies? Or can we develop this green fuel and infrastructure in a more considerate and just manner, both towards the environment and society? Some days I am pessimistic about climate change. It is horrifying that in 2021, we have seven Thames rivers of fossil fuels pouring out of the earth every second of every day. But some days I'm optimistic and I jump out of bed to work on green ammonia. Because while a Thames River full of ammonia is not a river I'd particularly like to swim in, it is a river that we can produce in this decade. And it is a carbon-free river made from water, air, wind, and sunshine. It is a river of energy and finance that can be used to make the world more just. But we've got a lot of work to do behind the scenes to make it happen. Thank you very much.